So, in the automata theoretic approach to linear time model checking, what we do is we start with a specification of the system. We start with a system model, which could be a labeled transition system, and then we want to check if the system always satisfies the specification. So in case uh, this is the case, what we get as a result is, yes, it's actually satisfied. And if the specification is not always fulfilled um, on the system model, what we get is a so-called counterexample lasso. So a lasso has two parts. It consists of a so-called handle, which tells you how to get the system into a state that can be uh, visited repeatedly often, and from which there's a so-called counterexample uh, lasso cycle that tells you how the system can evolve for uh, yeah, an unbounded duration, uh, such that this lasso together shows you that the specification is not always fulfilled. OK, so how does it work? Well, most of you have probably seen that in order to perform model checking, um, what, with the automata theoretic approach, what you need to do is to build a product automaton between a specification automaton that represents the negation of the specification that you want to check and a system model such as a label transition system. So here I've put two examples. Um, and now the question is, yeah, that's this one. So here's the label transition system. Here's the specification automaton. And essentially, you build the Cartesian product. Um, and as you can see here, it looks quite complicated. I didn't put here any edge labels, because that would uh, lead to a huge mess. And now what you try to do is uh, to see if there's a so-called accepting lasso in this product automaton. Uh, consisting of a lasso handle and a lasso cycle such that an accepting state is visited infinitely often. And if you find one of these lassos, uh, you know that this is actually an infinite execution in the label transition system, and you also know that it's accepted by the specification automaton, and since it represents the negation of the specification that you're really interested in, you know that the system actually violates uh, the specification in this case. So here, I've just put two example lassos for you. Um, so for example, this one here is one. And here's the accepting state that is visited infinitely often. And here's another one, which looks a bit more complicated. And now, if you're the tool developer of a model checking tool, um, you would normally want to give the user, which is a specification engineer or a system engineer, um, a short counterexample, because long counterexamples are difficult to understand. So in this case, you would probably give this lasso over here, because it's shorter than this lasso over here. But even more, since the system engineer doesn't really care about the specification automaton, you would only give the projection to the label transition system. And here's one very interesting thing that you can observe. So this lasso here, if you project it to the label transition system, it would be this lasso over here. And this more complicated one here, which is actually longer, if you project it to the label transition system, uh, you actually get this lasso. And now you can see this lasso is actually better, because the projection to the label transition system makes you take this cycle infinitely often, whereas this lasso here makes you take this cycle infinitely often. So when you just search for the shortest accepting lasso in the product, you don't get the shortest counterexample lasso, so to speak. Um, and yeah, and now the question is really, what can you do about this? Because model checkers build this product automaton, so apparently in order to find shortest counterexample lassos, we have to do something different. So the starting observation was really exactly what I've just uh, demonstrated to you, that finding a shortest lasso in the product automaton does not give us a shortest counterexample lasso in the system model alone. And one way to mitigate this issue is to move away from shortest lassos and search for something that is called a shortest witness. So this is a system trace uh, consisting um, of a prefix and then a suffix that is repeated infinitely often for some finite words um, where u and v together are observable traces of the system, so like the input and output that a system can have, where the sum of the length of u and v is as small as possible. Okay, so you can do this, um, but there are two drawbacks. So first of all, here you abstract from the state of the system. So if you're really a system engineer trying to understand how the system can evolve in a way such that it behaves badly, and you only look at the input and the output, the state of the system is gone. So normally, you're interested in the lasso and not so much in the witness. And secondly, as it has been shown earlier, um, 
even approximating the length of the shortest possible witness is NP-complete within any polynomial approximation function. So that's really a provably difficult computational problem. Um, so for the case of linear temporal logic, there's an alternative here. So um, Chupin and Biere once published a paper in which they show how to compute so-called tight specification automata. So they start with an LTL formula translated to a bookie automaton, and then this translation guarantees that the shortest accepting lasso in the product automaton also yields the shortest counterexample lasso if you just project it back. So in a sense, these bookie automata are well behaved if you're interested in short um, examples. So here are just some examples uh, to let you understand the idea. So here we have a non-deterministic bookie automaton for the specification that infinitely often an A should occur. Okay, so whenever an A occurs, you go to this state. However, if there is a second A just coming right afterwards, you're going to ignore this. But since you're only interested in whether A occurs infinitely often, that's a fine thing to do. Now, the problem here is that um, every accepting lasso needs to have uh, at least two states in the cycle. And if there's a single state in your system which can be repeated all of the time on which A holds, you're not going to find this in the product. So what you can do here is uh, to go from this automaton to this one where you have a self-loop over A on this accepting state. You also make it initial and voila, what you get is a so-called tight automaton that guarantees that you're not going to miss the shortest counter example. Okay. Um, however, that's restricted to LTL. It really doesn't work uh, for any other specification formalism. Okay, so all of this is nice, but it doesn't really answer the question how hard is finding shortest counterexample lassos in general. And by in general, I mean here four general omega regular specifications. So nowadays there are specification logics such as PDL or PSL, um, which are on their way to become industry standards. They go beyond LTL, and of course we still want to find shortest counterexamples, and then it was really the time to look at the problem of how difficult it is to find shortest counterexample lassos for general omega regular expressions. Okay, um, so there are two contributions in the paper. So first of all, what is being shown is that unfortunately again, um, yeah, the length of the shortest counterexample lassos is NP hard to approximate for bookie automaton specifications. So it's just as hard um, as in the shortest witness case. Then all bookie automata can be made tight, however. So that's like the positive um, result here. So the construction from Chopin and Biere, it can be generalized in a way, um, yeah, to apply to all omega regular expressions and all omega regular languages. Um, and finally, what is also in the paper um, is a demonstration that if we are only interested in minimizing the length of the lasso cycle, and we only have small, strongly connected... Okay, so this is, I think, what was being talked about. Yeah, yeah that the computer sometimes fails a bit. <laughs> so if you're only interested in uh, minimizing the length of the shortest lasso cycles, and you have a specification automaton with small, strongly connected components, then, um, yeah, this is a fixed parameter tractable. Okay, so for the remainder of the talk, I just want to demonstrate these three results uh, before we draw a conclusion. Okay, so the main result is, as already stated, that approximating the length of the shortest counterexample lasso is NP-hard within any polynomial approximation function. And to give you an idea of what this means, um, so every algorithm computing a counterexample lasso of length at most n to the power of 10, for n being the length of the shortest counterexample lasso, solves an NP-hard problem. So you can really forget about giving guarantees on finding something that is approximately short, unless, of course, P equals NP. Um, but th that's not something uh, that we can hope for, I guess. Okay, so how can you prove such a, such a thing? Well, the usual way of doing this is by performing a reduction from the satisfiability problem. Um, so for this proof, we need two parts. First of all, a system model we're interested in, and then a specification automaton. And the system model here is really, really simple. So we reduce from a satisfiability problem over n variables. And all we have here is a label transition system that is supposed to represent the values of n Boolean variables, where without loss of generality, 
um, the first value is just false. So the idea is that if you have a short lasso in here that actually goes through these states and then just cycles back, then this represents exactly one assignment to Boolean variables. And now you're probably not surprised that uh, we build a specification automaton where for every clause in the um, SAT formula, we have one of these gadgets which just tests when going from this state to this state that the assignment represented by the path through the label transition system represents a satisfying assignment. Okay, and now the idea is as follows. So we take these gadgets for every um, clause in a SAT instance and we replicate it many, many, many times, attach them next to each other, and what we get as a guarantee is that if we find a short counterexample lassos in this thing here alone, then it has to satisfy all of the clauses. And all we need to do is to replicate this a couple of times, namely polynomially often, and we get a hardness proof that shows that finding shortest counterexample lassos is really NP-hard to approximate for any polynomial approximation function. Okay, so this was the bad news, right? But luckily we also have some good news, uh, namely that whenever we have a bookie automaton, we can actually make it tight to ensure that if we build the product between the bookie automaton and the label transition system, um, the shortest counterexample lasso will not vanish and we are actually gonna find it. Okay, so um, in order to show you how this works, I need one more definition, namely the definition of an ultimately periodic word. So given an alphabet sigma, we say that a word is ultimately periodic if it's of the form u, v to the power of omega for some finite words u and v. So essentially, this looks like a lasso, however, just on the word level. Okay, so it is pretty well known that you can characterize the language of a bookie automaton by the set of um, ultimately periodic words it accepts. Okay, now there's a very nice result by Calibri et al. from 1993. So these guys showed that given a bookie automaton, A, we can translate A to a deterministic uh, automaton over finite words that accepts exactly the, form, uh, the words of the form u dollar v, where u v to the power of omega is accepted by the original bookie automaton. So in a sense, it's a representation of the set of all ultimately periodic words that the original bookie automaton accepts. Now, there's also a corresponding back translation that has been given a lot later. Um, so, let there be a deterministic automaton of a finite words, a prime given, that accepts exactly those four words of the form u dollar v, for which u v to the power of omega is accepted by some bookie automaton, we can translate, uh, sorry, this should be a prime, back to a bookie automaton accepting exactly these ultimately periodic words. So this is in a sense just a back translation. So what we get is that if we take both of these constructions um, and we concatenate them, the original automaton A is language equivalent to the automaton A prime prime that we get at the very end. Okay, now, and you may wonder, why did we even do this, right? If we translate back and forth, and uh, there is a very nice observation, namely that this back translation, it can be modified slightly to give you an additional guarantee. So if you modify it, then you can guarantee that for every word, u dollar v, accepted uh, by this deterministic automaton of a finite words, we actually have an accepting lasso in A prime prime of exactly the size um, that is the sum of the length of the part before the dollar and the part after the dollar. And now this is exactly now a tight automaton by definition. Um, because every accepting lasso, uh, sorry, every counterexample lasso that we search for in the label transition system, it exactly has such a form, u, and then there's a v part repeated infinitely often. So if the back translation guarantees us that we're gonna find this in A prime prime, we know that, um, yeah, we will not miss the um, shortest counterexample. Okay, so on the complexity side, if you look at how this back and forth translation works, um, you see that first you get an exponential blow up, and on the back side you get a quadratic blow up. So overall I would claim it's an exponential complexity roughly. And there's also a corresponding lower bound uh, 
from a very old paper by Kupferman and Vadi, where they showed that just for the safety case, there's already uh, a lower exponential bound. Now, there are still some quadratic factors and some log factors left that you can optimize out, but what I'm claiming here is that it's already roughly an optimal construction, and this is all we can actually hope for. Okay, and for the final result, um, what I want to show you is that if you're only interested in minimizing the length of the lasso cycle, then um, you get a polynomial time fixed parameter tractable algorithm for model checking. Okay. Um, so, and what we started with was the observation that apparently the complexity of the problem is really in the specification automaton, not so much in the size of the label transition system. Okay, so the question was if we can characterize more precisely what property of the specification automaton makes finding shortest counterexample lassos actually hard. Um, and we found out if there's a fixed upper bound on the size of the strongly connected components in a specification automaton, um, we can actually find shortest counterexample lassos uh, quite efficiently. So here's an example of a specification automaton um, where all strongly connected components have size two. So here there's one over there. And here there's another strongly connected component uh, which also has an accepting state. And the basic idea for finding shortest counterexamples in the product automaton is now that uh, Whenever in the product you enter some strongly connected components, you keep track of um, all the possible runs you could have in this component at the same time. So this causes an exponential blow up in the type of graph that you're building, and the details are in the paper, but it's only exponential in the number of states in the SEC. So if you have a fixed upper bound, uh, that doesn't really cost a lot, and you get uh, a polynomial time construction for finding shortest counterexample lessons. So again, the details are in the paper. Um, and just one side remark, there's a nice class of automata called universal very weak automata. And here, the um, strongly connected components always have size one. So here, it's very efficient to find uh, shortest counterexample lasso cycles. Okay, so to sum it up, what was tackled in this paper was the question how far, uh, how, <laughs> sorry, how hard finding shortest counterexample lassos in linear time model checking actually is. And we tackled this for full omega regular languages, um, and we had a couple of answers. First of all, unfortunately, the problem is NP hard to approximate within any polynomial approximation function, so you can really forget about having a nice efficient approximation algorithm. However, there was also the positive result that you can take every bookie automaton and make it tight, so that in the product you don't miss the shortest counterexample lassos anymore. And furthermore, if you're only interested in shortest counterexample lasso cycles, then having small strongly connected components in the specification automaton reduces your complexity. And as a final remark, of course we care about the practice of model checking. And one of the reasons why model checking works nowadays so well is that we have very nice tools and frameworks for reducing the number of states in specification automata. However, all of these nice minimization techniques, they can actually break um, the property of the automaton being tight. So as future work that remains to be done um, is tackling the question how we can minimize automata efficiently to, re uh, to retain the property that a specification automaton is tight. And in this way, I think uh, we can help system engineers to get shorter counterexample lassos and make model debugging more efficient. Thanks. Thank you. Um, yes, so this talk is about the translation from LTL to unambiguous Bücher automata. Um, but before I go into our translation, I would like to introduce the problem that actually um, led us to research these translations. So the point is that unambiguous automata actually have um, applications, and one such application is in probabilistic model checking. So first, um, let's, um, so the general model checking problem is given a structure and a formula, um, check whether the structure is a model of the formula. And for this instance that we just heard about, and where you have a transition system and an LTL formula, there is a nice um, theory um, that proposes to translate the negated LTL formula into an automaton and then check whether the, the product accepts the empty language. Um, and this is nice because we, can, we know a lot about these automata and we can manipulate them and so on. 
So in probabilistic model checking, um, one question that we ask is, given a Markov chain and an LTL formula, um, is the probability that the Markov, or that the random execution of the Markov chain um, satisfies phi higher than some um, lambda? And so here the, the crucial part is really to compute this um, probability and this is doable in exponential time. Now, um, what about the automata theoretic approach? Can we also um, have such a nice theory? So here the problem is that all the um, classical approaches, they require some kind of deterministic automaton to be able to compute this value in polynomial time. Um, and the um, translations from LTL to these deterministic automata, they suffer from a double exponential lower bound. So this is where unambiguous um, automata come in. For unambiguous Bichy automata, it was shown um, not so long ago that you can actually calculate this value in polynomial time. And also we know that there are, uh, that we can translate LTL to unambiguous Bichy um, in exponential time. So together this gives rise to an exponential time algorithm um, for, for deciding this problem. Um, but to apply this in practice, of course we, we need good translations from LTL to UBA and, and this is what I will be talking about. So now what are, what is this unambiguous um, Bushi automaton? What is unambiguity? So unambiguity can be seen as a, a generalization of determinism in some way. So in deterministic automata, they have the property that every word has a unique run. And unambiguous automata now, they um, satisfy the property that every, uh, every word should have at most one accepting run. So another way to, to say this is that if a word is accepted, there is a unique way of accepting the word. So there's a unique accepting computation of the, of the automaton. Okay, so what about translations from LTL to unambiguous Bichy? So this hasn't been researched very much because the applications were not clear, um, but I should say that some classical constructions from LTL to non-deterministic Bichy automata already produced unambiguous automata. However, these automata are often very big and um, later translations that um, perform well in practice and that were implemented, they do not guarantee unambiguity. So our question is really, um, can we get um, good translations from LTL to UBA? So one thing that has been tr um, tried is what I call formula disambiguation. So um, before translating the formula, you apply some rewrite rules on non-deterministic um, operators that guarantee that the later translations basically um, preserve, uh, that the later translations um, result in an unambiguous automaton. Um, so our approach is a bit different. We want to adapt um, a well-known translation from LTL to NBA um, that, that has been implemented, that works well, um, and that uses very weak alternating automata as an intermediate representation. And we want to adapt this translation in a way to um, produce UBA. So what we propose is to um, disambiguate on this level of the alternating automaton. And then we show also that the subsequent translation steps of this um, translation, so the alternating automata is translated into a generalized Bichy automaton, which is then degeneralized into a non-deterministic Bichy automaton. And these uh, steps now preserve this notion of unambiguity um, that we also introduce for, for this alternating automata. So before talking about this, I want to give you a brief intuition what these alternating automata are. So the classical um, automata model that we consider usually are non is non-determinism. And this non-determinism basically lies in the acceptance condition. So we say that um, an, a word is accepted if there exists an accepting run. So if, if I have multiple successors, um, this leads um, basically to the fact that the language of Q can be written somehow as the union of the languages of, of its successors. Um, now there's another way of viewing the same graph basically by requiring that all runs should, um, should, accept, uh, should be accepting for a word to be accepting. So for every successor I need to be able to extend the run. And this basically leads um, to an intersection here on the language level. And, this, and we call this universal branching. So alternating automata um, combine these two modes of branching. So what we get um, is a non-deterministic choice between such universal successor sets. So here's an example. Um, in this state, I can choose either, uh, reading A, I can choose either to go here and then accept A forever, 
or I can choose to go here and then I'm in two states and I need to make sure that B and C is true from this point on. So I need to accept from both of these states. Um, okay, so now because the um, transitions are more complicated, the notion of run becomes more complicated. We don't have single paths through the automaton, rather we have um, directed the cyclic graphs. And the idea is, so the, the vertices here, they correspond to some state of the automaton and the successors of a vertex, they should be exactly one of the universal successor sets of the automaton for the corresponding symbol. And these are directed the cyclic graphs, graphs, so we can layer them in this way and we call these um, sets that we get for each position layers of, of the run. Okay, so the last thing I need to tell you is what very weakness means. Um, but we already heard it, so <laughs> an automaton is very weak if every strongly connected component has size one. So there's no non-trivial cycles um, through the automaton. The only cycles that are allowed are um, sequences of self-loops. Okay, so now as for our translation. So first I need to tell you what we mean by unambiguity in this alternating world. Um, our notion of unambiguity is the following. So. We say that an alternating automaton is unambiguous if for all words, all accepting runs should agree on their layers. So we, ex so we allow for different runs as long as they have the la same layers. So I can give you an example. Um, here, these are two runs for some automaton. They are different because they differ in, in the choice of S, of the successor state of S here and here. Um, however, they have the same layers, so, so it's okay. And the reason we do this is because the layers of this run in the end corresponds to the states of the non-deterministic automaton. And indeed, using this um, definition, we can show that this original translation from VWAA to NBA um, preserves unambiguity. So if we have an unambiguous VWAA, we get an UBA in the end. <coughs> and checking this is p-space complete for, for VWAA. Okay, so what about our disambiguation procedure? The idea is, um, so we don't want to um, apply exhaustive um, transformations. We want to identify which parts of the automaton really induce um, this ambiguity. So what we do is we identify sources of ambiguity, and here we already use this translation to generalize Bushi, and then we apply local disambiguation transformations on the level of the, of the alternating automaton. And I will show you examples of these. But first, for, for the first, um, to this first uh, bullet. So um, the idea is to transform the VWA into a GBA and then apply um, a standard trick of checking an ambiguity for non-deterministic automata, which involves building the self-product, um, removing all states with, which accept the empty language. This is the trim function. And then checking whether there is a state um, that does not agree on the left and the right hand side. So I will show you. This is, the, this is the lemma that we use. A is ambiguous if and only if in this self product of the GBA there is a state that differs in left and right hand side. And the idea is that this corresponds to, some, so to two runs that differ on the la their layers at some position. And we call this an ambiguous configuration pair of, of A. And now given such an um, such an ambiguous configuration pair, okay, we assume that there, this is basically the first time that this happens, so there is a predecessor where they were still the same, otherwise we go backwards. Um, and if we have this, now we call S a source configuration, and we can show that, um, so this is a set of states of the VWA, it corresponds to some layer, and we can show that there is a state basically that contributes um, to this, um, this split that ultimately contributes to ambiguity. So there is such a VWA state that has a non-deterministic, two non-deterministic successor sets, um, and they are, basic, they are in these bigger sets Q1 and Q2, and they um, have non-disjoint languages. And this is the situation that we want to extract, and to such a situation P would two um, successor sets, we want to apply some local transformation. So, again, this is the picture that we, we translate to this self-product. We extract the source state P, which 
together with two successor sets, and now we give this back to the VWAA and apply some local transformations, which I want to um, explain now. So the first, um, I will explain them by giving you examples. Um, so here we have uh, a VWAA. In this state P, it can, when reading a symbol that, ex that satisfies B, it can either go left or right. So the left-hand side here, um, it's this outgoing edge means that if I read an A, I can accept immediately. So what this state accepts, and this um, red square means that it, this is a Cobuchy final state, so I need to move out eventually. So this um, state accepts the language, finally I read an A. So, and this state accepts the language globally B. And this is not unambiguous because words that accept or that satisfy finally A and globally B can go to both sides. So now we use an important um, thing about alternating automata. We can compute um, complement states. So for a state here, F, we can compute another state um, that accepts the complement language and without exponential blow up. So we compute such a state and we add it um, to this right hand universal successor set. So now we have a state here that accepts globally not A and in this um, K, so in, in this way, for every word, we can distinguish. Either, uh, um, either it accepts finally A, then it can only go to the left, um, or it doesn't, well, then it can only go to the right. So this automaton now is, is unambiguous. <laughs> okay, so this is um, the one transformation that we use. Um, the other is a heuristic targeted at states that accept languages of the form finally globally phi. Um, and the idea here is to make the following case distinction. If a word accepts finally globally A in this example, either it accepts globally A from the first position, so then we can just, that's, so therefore we can just add such a non-deterministic initial state, or um, there is a point where I read a not A, and from that point on I will only read A's. So in a way this state here, it, um, it uh, looks for the last position where not A holds. Because after going here, we can never see a not A again, and in this way, um, this automaton, and this is the case, or this is the reason why this automaton is unambiguous. And this trick is actually quite useful because many um, um, properties in the practice, like fairness conditions and so on, they have this um, alternating structure. Okay, so now as for our implementation tool, uh, also Dougie, <laughs> um, it basically does uh, what I have explained. Um, it um, computes the GBA, it, com it looks for the source states in the self product, um, and if it finds a source state, it, it applies local transformations on this level. Now, um, applying this naively um, may be very time inefficient or costly because um, this step here is the exponential step um, and we may have to recompute a lot. Um, so um, what we try to do then is um, we somehow try to um, construct only as much as we need to find the source state. So we do some kind of lazy construction of the automata. We look for, if we find such a state, we immediately um, give it back and apply the transformations here. And then um, we tell the subsequent automata which parts they need to recompute because, because we know that this was only a local change, so um, we may hope that not all the entire GBA needs to be recomputed. And in this way, using this, um, this loop, we actually uh, manage to reduce the running times um, significantly. So we benchmark this. Um, on formulas against the, this um, exhaustive rewriting, formula rewriting that is implemented in SPOT in the tool LTL to TGBA. And we used formulas um, from this LTL store which collects um, um, LTL formulas from the literature and so on. And we saw that in many cases we can actually produce smaller automata. So here a point, this point for example, it means that our tool produced an automaton for some formula of approximately 50 states and LTL to TGBA produced um, an automaton of 100 states or so for the same formula. Um, but um, I should say that the running times of LTL to TGBA are still faster, so uh, I mean, it's fa the, the, the other tool is faster often because we still do this, um, this loop and sometimes we may have to recompute automata, whereas 
um, a priori rewriting the formula, um, then you only need one path basically to get the UBA. Um, okay, that's basically what I wanted to tell you. So I've presented this disambiguation procedure for a VWAA, which identifies ambiguous situations and then applies local transformations. Um, maybe I could um, convince you a bit that alternating automata are useful for disambiguation, basically because they have the power of Boolean operations. So we can um, use uh, um, conjunction and we can use complementation well. And I think this is really helpful for disambiguation. Um, so I've talked a bit about our tool. Um, for future work, I think it would be really interesting to apply this idea of using alternating automata for disambiguation for different kinds of automata models. So for example, I think it should be um, possible to give a similar um, translation for non-deterministic, or a similar construction for non-deterministic Vichy automata. Yeah, that's it, uh, thank you. This talk is going to be split into two parts. So first we're going to look at what uh, we mean by generic partition refinement. And then we're going to see how to instantiate this generic version for the specific system of weighted tree automata. And so to first look at uh, what partition refinement actually is, um, it's an algorithmic schema that's used in a number of different algorithms. Some of you uh, may know some of them. Uh, for example, the page Tarjan algorithm for minimizing uh, transition systems, Hopcroft's automata minimization algorithm, uh, but also Markov chain lumping and some lesser well-known uh, such as color refinement, and there are many more of them. And they all have kind of similar complexities, as you can see, and they all minimize some state-based system by uh, regarding st states as equivalent under some equivalence. And they all work in a similar way by first regarding all the states as equivalent and then successively uh, refining this initial partition uh, until a greatest fixed point is reached and then we're done. And so since all of them are so similar, it would be cool if we could uh, provide a generic algorithm that uh, works for all these different system types and has a comparable runtime complexity. And we do this by using co algebraic partition refinement. So uh, this uses some language from category theory, uh, namely co algebras, um, to talk about state-based systems generically. So co algebras consist of a set of states X and a transition map that maps states from X to some kind of successor structure. And what this successor structure actually is is determined by this type functor. And there are different examples of type functors. For example, uh, the functor power set of A times X and quadrabras for this functor correspond to label transition systems. Quadrabras for the functor two times X to the A correspond to deterministic automata. And uh, there's a functor for Markov chains and so on and so on and we can uh, describe very different types of transition systems. So now that we know how to talk about a transition system or a state-based system in a general way, um, we can start thinking about minimization. And we first need some kind of equivalence of states uh, by which to minimize the system. And co-algebras provide us with such an equivalence. It's called co-algebraic behavioral equivalence. And it's defined as follows. Two states are regarded as equivalent if they are identified by some co-algebra homomorphism. So a co-algebra homomorphism is a map between co-algebras that preserves their structure. And if two states are identified by one such homomorphism, then we regard them as equivalent. And so to look at what co-algebraic behavioral equivalent means for the individual system types um, for label transition system, it corresponds to strong bisimilarity. For uh, these deterministic automata, it corresponds to language equivalence, and for Markov chains to weighted by similarity, and so on, and so on. And uh, you have to do this. You have to look into what co-algebraic behavioral equivalence actually is for your system type in question. So for example, for non-deterministic automata, it's not language equivalence, it's some kind of bisimilation. Um, 
but most often it's some kind of useful equivalence that you get uh, from this. So now that we know the uh, equivalence, we can uh, provide a generic minimization algorithm that takes as input a functor f that describes the type of system and a coalgebra for this functor that describes the system itself. And as output, it gives a partition of states under coalgebraic behavioral equivalence. And this, fun this algorithm is completely generic. Um, it doesn't know about what functor you put in um, and works for very different types of systems, um, except for this little thing here to the right, which we call refinement interface, which is actually functor specific. And just to see why uh, we need this, we have to look at how uh, partition refinement usually works. So if you remember the first slide where we had these blocks of states and we split the blocks and further refined this partition, um, let's assume we're in the middle of this process and we're just uh, having split the block S into two subblocks, uh, the block B into two subblocks S and B without S. And this is new information now. Uh, we know that uh, the states in S could still be equivalent and the states in B without S could also be still equivalent, but the states in S won't be equivalent to the states in B without S. And we can use this to further split other blocks. So for example, uh, if we have a block A that has three states and some transitions into S and B without S, in this case, we have weighted transitions. So the transitions have weights on them. Uh, could be a different uh, type of system. It works for all of them. Um, in this case, the first state has a total weight of one into S and zero into B without S. The second state has 0 0.5 into both of the blocks. And uh, this, the third state has one into B without S and zero into S. And so they have different total weights into S and B without S, and we should consequently regard them as different, not equivalent, and split the block A. And this is how it works. You uh, split blocks, and then you learn something, and split further blocks from this information. And now, there are two things that are important about this. First, um, to get a good running time, this logarithmic part of the running time, um, we need to do this by only looking at predecessors of S. So in this case, we're not allowed to even look at this state. Um, that's where the good running time comes from. And then uh, another important thing is that we have to talk about total weights into blocks. So in this case, we, we sum up the labels on the edges to get the total weight into a block. And this is something that crucially depends on the type of system. If you have weights on the labels, then you have to sum them up. If uh, you have a standard transition system, then you just need to know that there are edges in a block, uh, into a block. And so this is the part that is actually dependent on which type of system we're talking about. And we have encapsulated this part into this refinement interface. And so the refinement interface consists uh, first of an encoding for the functor. This is just so that we can represent coalgebras in computer memory or as input files or something like that. Uh, we regard the coalgebra as a labeled graph uh, by uh, defining a set of labels and then uh, mapping it into a graph. And the refinement interface itself, which has to be implemented for each function, for each type of system, uh, consists of some completely abstract type of weights, W. Uh, so if you implement such a refinement interface, you can uh, think of your W and use whatever you want, provided it works. And uh, then two functions, init and update. And to get a feeling for what they do, let's look at update. Um, update gets two parameters, the labels into this subblock, if you remember the, the previous slide with the blocks, and the total weight into the whole block B. And from this, it has to compute the total weight of S and the total weight of B without S. So we get the labels into S, the total weight of B, and have to compute the weights into S and B without S from this. And here's an example. For example, for this kind of weighted systems, um, we take labels to be just weights from uh, the reals and weights to be tuples. And uh, then we can define init and update by 
summing up weights here and subtracting weights there, and uh, it's really not that hard, and it's not a complete uh, minimization algorithm. So if you do this, you get plug it into the algorithm, and then uh, you get a whole minimization algorithm for the system. And most of the time, you don't even have to do it, um, because the system is also modular, which means that if your functor uh, that you are providing the refinement interface for is a composite of other functors, and you already have refinement interfaces for these other functors, then you get the refinement interface for the composite functor for free. So we have implemented refinement interface for many functors that appear in practice, so, which means that most of the time you don't have to implement anything. You can just use this modularity, get your refinement interface for free. Um, and when I say implemented, I mean implemented because it's also not just an abstract algorithm, it's uh, also an implementation called uh, COPA, which means we lose on the cute name uh, side. Uh, and you can download it here if you want. It takes as input a file that contains the functor specification and the core algebra in a general and abstract syntax, and then uh, produces a partition of states. And it also has this refinement interface that has to be implemented for each functor, and the refinement interface in this case is a Haskell type class. If you look at this slide, you can see that it kind of corresponds to the math version, also has two functions in it and update, and they have similar parameters. And it's also modular, which means you don't have to do this if your functor is a composite and the parts are already implemented. So um, to look at the complexity of this algorithm, we now know that it's generic, it should also be efficient, um, we need to know that uh, the complexity of the whole algorithm will be dependent on how efficient your init and update implementation is. So uh, we say that init and update are allowed to uh, use linear time in the number of labels that they are passed as a uh, second parameter in the case of init and uh, first parameter in the case of updates, that's a list of labels, can be linear in this list and then it can have some component uh, that depends on the size of the coalgebra, number of states and number of transitions. And if you know that your init and update is that fast, then the algorithm overall has a complexity of m plus n times log n times this uh, something p that comes from the complexity of init and update. And slide catches that modularity may add intermediate states, so you have to account for those if you do complexity analysis. Um, but for most functors, this p is actually one, which means that the overall complexity of the algorithm is m plus n times log n, which may sound familiar if you uh, read the first slide carefully. And so together, we get a whole table of systems that we support. Um, and you can see here the running time of our implementation and the running time of the specific algorithm that is known from the literature. And most of the time, our implementation instantiated to this system type matches the running time of the specific algorithm. And sometimes uh, it's also, it's a little bit worse, but sometimes it's also a little bit better, which means that our instantiation of the generic algorithm actually produces better running time than the specific algorithm that was known beforehand. And one such case is uh, the case of weighted tree automata for non cancellative monoids. And we'll look into that in a bit more detail now. So weighted <coughs> tree automata consist of a set of state, a ranked alphabet, which just means that uh, the letters have averages, a semi-ring, a final weight distribution that assigns weights to states, and a transition function that takes a letter from the input alphabet of every k, k states, another state, and assigns a weight to the whole thing. So to get a feeling for what the is weighted tree automata can actually do, uh, let's look at an example language that they can recognize. Uh, so this is the language SIGSAC. It's defined over the alphabet of one constant and one binary symbol and the semi-ring of natural numbers. And languages for weighted tree automata 
are also called tree series, and they assign weights from the semi-ring to trees over the alphabet. And so in this case, zigzag uh, assigns one to the constant trees, and two to trees that have a constant in the left subtree. You can see this here. And then it's recursively defined for uh, larger trees. And uh, you can define a weighted tree automaton that uh, recognizes this language. So I won't show it here. It's just uh, to give you an idea how weighted tree automata work. And now we want a minimization algorithm for those. So what do we have to do to instantiate our generic algorithm to this specific case for weighted tree automata? And there are a few tasks. First, we have to describe what the functor is, such that coalgebras for this functor correspond to weighted tree automata. And in this case, it's the functor m times m to the power of sigma x, where sigma x is the polynomial functor for this uh, signature. And it may not be completely obvious to you, but uh, if, you, uh, if you use this stuff, you will get a feeling for what the functor actually is. And then, as I said in the beginning, you have to look at what coalgebraic behavioral equivalence means for this uh, functor, for coalgebras for this functor. And in this case, it's something that was known before, something that has been described called backwards by simulation. And so we know, okay, we can describe uh, weighted tree automatas as uh, coalgebras, and we can minimize them by backwards by simulation if we just implement the refinement interface for weighted tree automata. And in this case, the functor is a composite. So uh, we know that we can rely on the parts of the functor um, to get a refinement interface for the whole functor. And in this case, the parts would be um, the product with m functor, the monoid valued functor, where monoid is the additive monoid from the semi-ring, and the polynomial functor for the signature. And for two of those, luckily, we already have refinement interfaces. We needed them before we implemented them. Uh, they, are already there. they are already there. Uh, but for monoid-valued functors, it's a bit more complicated because we need to distinguish between cancellative and non-cancellative monoids. So a monoid is cancellative if, yeah, who would have guessed, uh, you can cancel elements, uh, in this case from the right, but if the monoid is commutative, uh, also from, from the left. Um, and the nice thing about cancellative monoids is that you can embed them into groups. And we already have a refinement interface for groups. So to minimize a weighted tree automaton for a cancellative monoid, we just embed the monoid into a group, then use the algorithm for the refinement interface for groups, and we're done. But in the non-cancellative case, it's a little bit more complicated because what can't you do in non-cancellative monoids? You can subtract. But subtraction is something we need. Um, if you look at this picture that you saw before uh, in the implementation of update, we know the total weight into S and the total weight into B and somehow need to compute the total weight into B without S. So you would usually do this by subtracting the total weight of S by the total weight of, uh, subtracting the total weight of uh, S from B. Okay? So um, if you can subtract, this is easy. If you can't, you have to think a bit. Um, because in this case, we know that those total weights are actually always sums of labels of edges. For example, uh, in the S case, the total weight into S is just the sum of the labels A1 to AN. And since S is a subblock of B, uh, we know that edges into S are also edges into B. And so if you look at those sums that uh, produce the weights, uh, the, the weight of S are those A's, and the weight of B are yeah, some B's, but also the A's, because the edges also go to B. And so you can subtract by not uh, evaluating the sums ever and just storing the elements, and then take elements out of the sum by uh, just removing them from lists and um, adding by adding elements to this list of, uh, for this sum. So if we just uh, store and manipulate our sum symbolically, 
uh, we can actually subtract, in, at least for the cases where we need subtraction. And um, if we don't store them, these sums at list, but be a little bit more clever, we can store them as balanced search trees. And the size of those trees is bounded in the minimum of the number of uh, elements in the monoid and the number of edges in the coalgebra, because there can't be more different elements than the monoid has. And there also can't be more different elements than there are actually edges in the coalgebra, which means whatever is smaller uh, is the bound for our trees. And then we know that operations, or most operations for balanced search trees, uh, use logarithmic time. And so we get this complexity for these trees. And we can implement update uh, in this complexity. So it's linear in the number of labels that's passed to it. And then we have this strange logarithm of the minimum of the number of elements of the monoid and the number of edges in the core algebra. And if we squint at this, we know that our p parameter for this complexity is this part. And then from this, we can derive the overall complexity of the algorithm. But we can still distinguish finite from infinite monoids. Because for finite monoids, uh, in the asymptotic case, the number of elements in the monoid will always be smaller than the number of edges in the coalgebra. So this thing actually collapses to a constant. And we get the complexity m log m. Uh, but if the monoid is infinite, the number of elements in the monoid will always be more than the number of edges in the coalgebra, because the coalgebra is finite. And um, in this case, we get logarithmic in the number of edges. And so the whole complexity is m times log m squared. So we have these two complexities. And uh, we now know we have implemented the refinement interface for weighted tree automata. We know what the complexity is, and we can uh, implement it in our Haskell implementation. And we did. And we tested it on some inputs. So uh, we tested it uh, on a machine that has 16 gigabyte of RAM, which has generated larger and larger tree automata until our tool couldn't minimize it into si in 16 gigabyte of RAM, because uh, RAM was the, uh, the issue here. Um, we uh, used different signatures and different monoids. And in all of those cases, the maximum uh, um, weighted tree automata that we could uh, minimize had somewhat around 11 to 17 million edges. And the minimization ran in under five minutes. So uh, the Haskell implementation, I mean, it's Haskell. It's uh, not the best of the world, but it's OK. Um, and then we have our implementation. And we can add it to the big list of supported systems. Um, and in this case, even with a better complexity than the one that was known from the literature before. So implementing the refinement interface, thinking of the complexity, we have another instance. And we didn't even implement something about partition refinement for weighted tree automata, just the refinement interface. All right. So that concludes my talk. Uh, hi, so uh, I'll be presenting a paper on equilibrium-based uh, probabilistic model checking for concurrent stochastic games. I'm Gabriel, and this is joint work with Marta Katkowska, uh, Gaffney Norman, and Dave Parker. Just a bit on the structure of the presentation. I'm going to give uh, an overview and motivation on probabilistic models, uh, talk a bit about the uh, background definitions needed for work on normal form games and extensive games in equilibria, talk about our proposal for equilibrium-based verification, and have some uh, conclusion remarks and present of the, uh, some of the future work. Uh, so probabilistic models have a long history now in, in, form, in formal methods and verification. You have uh, various classes of models that have been proposed to deal with uh, uncertainty in models. We have uh, DTMCs, which are discrete time Markov chains, continuous times Markov chains, or CTMCs. You have MDPs, which are Markov decision processes, probabilistic automatism, and stochastic Petronet and, and others. Uh, they allow, again, for the specification of a certainty that can be due to noise or rates or different uh, aspects of your model. 
And the models can be uh, and are usually extended with uh, reward structures uh, that enable uh, quantitative analysis to be performed uh, on a wider set of metrics, such as cost or times or reliability and things like that. Uh, more specific about games, uh, games uh, enables the specification of adversarial behavior, rational behavior. So here, we, now we're talking about models in which the behavior is not determined only by probabilities or only by a single agent, but, but actually by, a, mo uh, by a, a, a couple or at least two or more agents. And uh, while games are usually come from, uh, uh, are usually uh, more used in economics and other uh, uh, science domains, they also have been applied, uh, game theoretic concepts have also been applied for, uh, to computer science problems such as uh, network pr protocols, attack defense scenarios, and, and others. Uh, so now more deeply about the types of games that have been considered in uh, computer science, you have, you can, one of the possible divisions are the, in, in how they progress. So you have turn-based games and concurrent stochastic, we have turn-based stochastic games, or TSGs, or concurrent stochastic games, or CSGs. So in both models, you have discrete time steps, you have discrete probability distributions, you have the possibility of non-determinism, you can specify adversary behavior, but in, for concurrent stochastic games, you also have concurrent actions. So the classical examples here would be, a turn-based game would be like a game of chess, so you move, your opponent moves, and that's how the game progresses. And a concurrent stochastic game is the classical example would be rock, paper, scissors, so you both move at the same time. And in terms of type of properties that have been considered as well, you can have your zero-sum properties in which you're assuming is strictly adversarial behavior, so uh, the, uh, the goals of the two players in the games are conflicting. You have multi-objective properties in which you're usually more interested in examining the trade-offs between two different properties. And you can have now equilibrium-based properties, which uh, hopes to establish the cooperation through uh, stable strategies. And why bother uh, modeling and verifying concurrent games at all? Well, concurrent stochastic games, it, gener it generalizes the other class of discrete time stochastic systems. So whatever behavior you can uh, uh, express with a DTMC or uh, uh, NMDP or a turn-based game, you can express with a concurrent. Uh, stochastic games, so they allow for a wider class of problems to be studied. Uh, we can also perform not only verification, but also a strategy synthesis, uh, which makes it possible to, be, to build controllers automatically. And previous works on automatic verification have mainly focused on, uh, for extensive games at least, have mainly focused on strictly competitive systems. So the work that I'm going to present here is uh, some mo new model checking algorithms, a property specification logic, and an implementation for equilibrium-based verification and strategy synthesis. So just now, I need to lay out some of the background definitions for, for you to understand what's been done here. And one of them is that of a normal form game. So a normal form game is, uh, is defined as a tuple. You have a, fi a finite set of players. You have a finite set of action for each player. And you have a joint action, which is composed by the Cartesian product of each individual action. And you have a utility function for each player as well. And then you have uh, U, which is a, in the definition of the normal formal game, which is a tuple for the individual utility functions of each player that maps a joint action to a real number. Uh, some other definitions that are, are needed here is that of a mixed strategy. So a mixed strategy for a player is nothing more than a probability distribution over its action set. Uh, you also have a strategy profile, which is then a tuple with one uh, strategy for each player in that game. And you have, and then you can compute things like an expected utility for a player, which is nothing but the weighted sum of the utilities with respect to the product of the individual actions. Uh, one classical example from game theory is of uh, what's known as a stag hunt game, or coalition of stag hunt that I described here. So here you have two players. Uh, all games that I'm going to talk about here are actually they are multiplayer in the sense that they can define many players. But they're only they are actually two-player games in the sense that you group them into two separate coalitions. So here you have a, a reward matrix for one of the coalitions, and here you have a, another reward matrix for this for the other coalition. And the idea behind this game here is that hunters go into a forest and they can cooperate and catch a stag, which is considered as being a higher payoff, 
or they can defect or refuse to cooperate, uh, cooperate and then they can only catch a hair, which is regarded as a lower payoff. So here you, uh, we have uh, two coalitions. So B uh, is uh, the actions of the, of the column coalition, and uh, these A's are the actions of the row coalition. So if uh, this coalition, the, the, uh, the hunter uh, decides to cooperate, while the, nobody in this coalition uh, cooperates, it gets zero, but the other coalition can still catch a couple of hairs, so can, they get four. And if everybody cooperates, so here, which will be A1 and B2, this, uh, this player gets six and the other coalition gets nine. That's more or less the, uh, the rationale behind this game. Uh, so some further definitions are necessary, like so you have the, the no this notion of a best response. A best response is a, which is identified by uh, Sigma star. H is a strategy that uh, no matter what the other player may play, you cannot do any better than playing Sigma star. So, and, and it's a best response in that sense. Uh, and uh, uh, a Nash equilibrium is defined then over strategy profiles, so over those tuples of individual strategies. And a, it is, and a Nash equilibrium is nothing more than a tuple of best strategies. So each strategy in that tuple of, that makes up the strategy profile is a best response to the other strategies. And on top of that, we can define this notion of a social welfare optimal Nash equilibrium, which is the one, uh, the, among the, of the set of possible Nash equilibria, the one that maximizes the sum of the utilities for, uh, for all players. So for the coalition stack hunt again, uh, the, the same example, we have three possible equilibria. One in which everybody defects, so this player, the uh, row player gets two, this, uh, the uh, column player gets four. You have another one that gets a similar utilities in which they randomize between the actions of cooperation and defection. And the best for them is for everybody to cooperate. So they get the higher payoff of six and nine, and this is the social welfare Nash equilibrium because it maximizes exactly the sum of the, of the utilities that players get. Moving on from this normal form games, which is these games that you play one round and the game is over, then we have this notion of games play, played over graphs. So then a uh, concurrent stochastic games, which again, so you have uh, a concurrent stochastic game of CSG, which would be then a tuple that have a finite set of players, a finite set of states, and a, a finite set of initial states. You have uh, Again, action sets for each of the players, and now you augment them with a bottom action, which identifies a states where the players can actually choose anything. And you have then a joint action, which is then also the Cartesian product. You have an action assignment function that maps states to the power sets of the unions of these individual action, action sets. I have a probabilistic transition function that takes a state, a joint action, and maps that to a distribution over the next states. Uh, a set of atomic propositions that are propositions associated to each state and a labeling and a labeling function that does exactly that, that associates states to the power set of uh, atomic propositions. So an example of a, then a, an extensive game or a concurrent stochastic game is the one of medium access control. So here you have a game where you have two users with limited energy. Uh, they share sharing a wireless channel and, sh and they can in each state can either choose to transmit or wait. They both transmit, the transmissions then fail due to an interference with probability one minus Q. So here we have the states, so this would be the, this here is an instance for a, uh, a model in which the users only have one unity of energy. And here you have the variables that keep track of the energy left and the number of uh, uh, messages that have been su successfully transmitted. So here from the initial state, if they both try to transmit at the same time with, with rate Q, they fail, so they have no energy left, but one of, uh, uh, with, uh, actually with rate Q, they succeed, so they have no energy left, but they have been successful at transmitting their messages. And with rate one minus Q, they both fail, so they get to this state where they can't, uh, they can't transmit anymore because they don't have any energy left, and they have failed. So no messages has been successfully sent. And in this state, they can only wait. So the type of questions that you want to ask here is how to maximize the collective, the collective probability of successful transmissions. So if you were to compute this property for this game here, 
uh, the obvious choice is for one of them to transmit while the other one waits, and then the other one transmits, and or one transmits while one waits, and the other player transmits in the next round. So you have two Nash equilibrium for, for, this, type, for this model. Back to some more definitions that unfortunately I have to give. Uh, uh, so you have the, this notion of a path. A path is nothing but a, se a sequence of states. So you have a sequence of states and joint actions which are not now identified by alpha, which again is uh, one action by, uh, which is formed by a tuple of one action for each player. And you have this condition that for you to, if you have two states in a path, given that you've performed uh, alpha y in, instead, uh, in state s y, then the, for you to actually have that path, then the, the probability of reaching s, s, s i plus one from s i while playing alpha i is greater than zero. And also the definition of a strategy here, so similar to what we defined for normal form games, uh, a strategy is just a way of resolving the choices of a player based on the execution so far. So a strategy for a player is just a function that maps finite paths to distribution over actions at each, uh, at each state. And such that if you're going to play uh, action AY at a state, at, at a given state in a path, then that action needs to be within the set of enabled actions for that state. Some more definitions. Uh, so a strategy profile, we have that of a strategy profile, which is Similarly to what we defined for normal form games, again, it's just a tuple of actions, one for, each, uh, one for each player that yields then a strategy for the overall game. And as for DTMCs and MDPs, once you, have the, once you don't have non-determinism anymore because you have the choices resolved, you can then uh, establish a, a probability measure over the site of infinite paths. And you can also associate a to in finite paths, a random variable that maps in finite paths or in finite runs to a real. So here is the equivalent of what we had for, for instance, for the for for the normal form games in the stag hunt. It's essentially a, the expression of a utility function that maps results of the games to uh, a payoff for the uh, for each player, and you can then compute that uh, the expected rewards by just again, a weighted sum over the, over the set of infinite paths. So here we use those random variables to describe objectives for each player, uh, which would be then a random variable associated uh, to, yeah, that would map infinite paths to, uh, to a real number. And they can uh, encode then uh, the probability of an event happening or expect the cumulative reward for reaching a target, for instance. Uh, the very, very, very slide of definition of promise. So, uh, so here, given that we have now the definition of a strategy profile for over extensive games, then we define this notion of a sub-game perfect epsilon Nash equilibrium. Here, epsilon Nash, because the value that we're going to compute is going to be arb arbitrarily close to the ideal value, but actually zero Nash equilibrium is not actually guaranteed to exist for extensive games. So that's why we need to... Uh, to consider uh, this uh, different class of, of, of equilibria. And a subgame and subgame perfect because you're gonna have an equilibrium for each state in the game. So a social affair optimum variance in the sense of considering the one that's going to maximize utility is defined in a similar way, similar way as we define for normal form games. But here we're going to now consider the sum of the expected utilities for each player. And so the intuition is just that a subgame perfect equilibrium is such that it's not beneficial for any player to unilaterally change their strategy at any, in any state. And they, these are guaranteed to exist for concurrent stochastic games. So recalling the medium access control example in which you had at each state the, usual, the users can either transmit or wait, then we could define properties like this. So imagine that you have a tom an atomic proposition send i that represents a successful transmission by player i. So you can have uh, people that are familiar with PCTL uh, pr probably won't have a hard time with this, but so here we have the definition of two coalitions, one of player one and another one of player two, and you trying to compute the sum of eventually player one being successful at sending his message and player two being successful at sending his message. And we're comparing that with a bound of two, which then translates to, is it possible for both players to successfully transmit their packets with probability one? 
uh, or you can get into something more complicated. For instance, if you can consider the probability of not send two until send one, or plus the probability of not send one until send two. So here, you're actually trying to compute what would be the probability, uh, the sum of probabilities of one player being the uh, being the first one to successfully transmit. Uh, so here's the uh, overall uh, grammar of RPTL, which is, stands for probabilistic alternating time logic with rewards, which is the logic that we've used for expressing properties for turn-based and concurrent games. Uh, so we've extended that now to equilibria, so we're going to focus on this uh, operator here. So in theta, you can either have a sum of probabilities of a, or a sum of uh, of values that would be defined by the reward operator. So, I mean, we have the, uh, the classical operators and atomic propositions, so true, uh, an atomic proposition, negation, conjunction, we have a probabilistic operator, a rewards operator, and now the equilibrium one. And as path uh, formula, you can have next, uh, bounded until, and unbounded until. And for the reward operator, you can compute instantaneous rewards, cumulative bounded rewards, or reachability rewards. Um, and now just a little bit on the intuition behind the, the semantics of it. So for the equilibria operator, for a formula of, uh, for, a, for an equilibria-based formula to be satisfied at a given state, it means that there exists a pair of strategies, which is a sub-game perfect social welfare national, national equilibrium for, for those objectives. So you're essentially computing the expected uh, values for those random variables and comparing that to the bound of, to a bound defined by tilde x. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail on how it is for the rewards operator because you have different and several operators which are complicated. But for a probabilistic reachability, for instance, the idea would be that if uh, that, that random variable gets one at, at some point, if, at, if for, for paths that at some point satisfy uh, psi psi y, and if they never satisfy that property, they get zero. Uh, some I, uh, intuition on how we go about computing values for Nash formulae. So we, to solve those bimatrix games at each state, we use a method of label polytopes uh, and, and a reduction of that to, to, to SMTs. So we actually uh, incorporate SMT methods to, to compute those, uh, those equilibria. And we compute a subgame perfect social fair Nash equilibrium values over finite game trees at each at each iteration. I add here the reference of the paper where I have a more detailed discussion, an extended version of the paper in which we have a more ex uh, extended discussion on that, and also present the correctness of algorithms and and and, and other information. So you use uh, backwards induction to compute values for bounded properties and value iteration for unbounded, and we do have two assumptions uh, that for non-zero formula, which are equilibrium-based properties, uh, that includes the until path formulae, that there are no terminal and components, and for the reachability ones, that the targets are reached with probability one under all strategy profiles, and we need those assumptions in order to guarantee convergence. Uh, some intuition how we go about computing. So if you have a formula like this, so a sum of reachability, uh, reachability properties, one for one coalition, the other one for the other coalition. So the values are computed uh, as a limit, so you, but using value iteration, but, uh, 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 and computing again iteratively over uh, finite game trees. So, if, and you have valuations for each state, so if at any state, this, both of them are satisfied. It's okay. Uh, so the state get a valuation, get a pair of valuations one, one. Uh, if just for each, just phi one is satisfied, then you get one for that property, and for the one you get the maximum probability of satisfying the second. Similarly, phi two is satisfied, and for all other states, you compute the value of a bimatrix, bimatrix game uh, for, uh, formed by these matrices Z1 and Z2, which are actually which are constructed with the weighted sum of the valuations of the next states. 
Um, some details on complexity. So complexity is linear in the size of the formula, but the finding optimal values and subgame uh, perfect uh, Nash equilibrium for reachability objectives of two-player games in P-Space. These are not our results, and I add the, the references to them here. Uh, value iteration requires solving an LCP problem, which is a linear complementarity problem. That uh, so computing Nash equilibrium for two players uh, falls into this class of problems of size cardinality of A for each state at each iteration. And for strategy synthesis, we need to both store the social affair Nash equilibrium strategies for the for the bimatrix games solved in each state, but we also have to combine them with the MDP strategies, which are the results of these uh, part of the computation here. Uh, and the synthesized strategies, they require both randomization and memory. Uh, so I'm going to go over some of the case studies to consider. So one of them was a uh, scenario of a robot coordination. So here you have consider robots moving over a grid. And you, con you consider that this blue robot wants to get here, and this orange robot wants to get here. So they want to go to each other's positions. And, but at any point, if a robot tries to move into a cell, it has a probability of Q over 2 of moving to an adjacent cell. And types of properties that we could verify with this would be, for instance, what's the maximum uh, if both robots eventually reach their goals without crashing. So not crash until go 1 plus not crash until go 2. Or you can also have a mixture of bounded and unbounded formulae and added restriction for the second robot. So here we consider that the first robot can eventually reach its goal at some, at some point in the future, but the second robot has to reach its goal within 10 time units, for instance. So in, in this case, one of them is more urgent than the other, and this robot could actually take a longer route, while this could take the diagonal route, for instance. Uh, there's a lot that could be said about these plots, but here the general idea was to showcase the advantages of uh, considering equilibrium-based strategies instead of zero-sum ones. Let's see, uh, because in order to show that players can actually do better if they cooperate instead of they just assume uh, that other players are out to get them and play against each other. Uh, so in red here we have the, cur the curve of values for the equilibrium-based prop uh, equilibrium property. And in the blue and um, yellow curves, you have the possible values if they actually played min-max strategies or if they played uh, strategies that uh, are, if they actually played against each other instead of cooperate with each other. Uh, and so here the type of property would be uh, considering a, a certain number of steps to reach their goal. And we have the number of steps here. And L is uh, the size of the grid. So you consider a grid of 10 by 10. And so you can actually see that if the robots actually adopt the clever strategies, they can do better for all number of steps. And they can all, and, and the strategies actually to maximize the collective probability of reaching their goals actually depend on the dimension of the grid. Because if you have an odd grid, they, can, they, they might actually be forced into taking the diagonal route, and the likelihood of them crashing is higher. Uh, another case study was of Aloha, so another net, net, uh, network pro protocol. So we have users trying to send packets. The, accessible, the probability of accessible packet being sent decreases if more players try to send uh, a packet simultaneously. And if a packet fails, then the number of slots the user waits before resending is set to according to an exponential backoff scheme. And there's a backoff back of counter, and uh, the protocol randomly chooses the slots that each uh, user would have to wait. And here again, just to showcase the advantages of the probability strategies, uh, if instead of, so if they collaborate, they can actually increase the number of success, successful messages sent by a given deadline. So here you also have the curve for the equilibrium values, and here for the zero-sum properties, if you were to verify them. Uh, just a table of instances and case studies that I have considered. So I have the Aloha and the robot coordination one that I covered more or less. We also considered a, a larger instances of the medium access control and another case study of a power control. This type of properties that, that we consider uh, using both unbounded and bounded probably, probability and rewards operators. And so for some, it depends a lot on the structure of the model, but for the Aloha, so we have models of 2 million states and 10 million transitions were verified in under two minutes. 
of the robot coordination and 27 million transitions and a bit over last 500,000 states. It's a little over an hour, but those uh, verification times are much better now, uh, given to some improvements in the implementation. Uh, and just some of the conclusions then. So we presented the logic, algorithms, and a tool for model checking and strategy synthesis for concurrent stochastic games using Nash equilibrium-based properties. Uh, the objectives can capture probability of events occurring or reward measures. And for solving the, the equilibrium at each state, we, we integrate the SMT-based methods that compute values which are sub-game perfect uh, social fair optimal for both collisions. Some of the future work we're consider, considering other type of equilibria, uh, extending our approach to, for, to non-collisional properties, that is not having only two collisions, but more than two. Uh, you have the reverse problem of mechanism design. Instead of computing the values for this formula, uh, trying to compute the model parameters or reward structures for a given property to be satisfied. And also some improvements can be done in terms of the, equilibri the local equilibrium computation at each state. So uh, this is not a part of a release yet. Uh, it's, we have a, a development branch of PRISM uh, in which you can uh, check the case studies and use the tool to compute both the zero-sum properties and equilibrium-based properties for concurrent games if anyone is interested. That's it. Thank you.